puns. And be incarnate as a human being. Now, where my critique of the Muslim concept of God would come in at this point is that I think that the Muslim concept of God is not the greatest conceivable being. I would, in, and I have, pre criticized the Muslim concept of God precisely because it isn't the greatest concept. And in what way would I say that? I think the greatest conceivable being would be an all-loving being. His, his love would be unconditional, impartial, and universal. And this is the kind of love that Jesus revealed of our Heavenly Father. By contrast, the God of the Quran is partial, his love is conditional, you have to earn it, and it is uh, not uh, universal. He does not love sinners. Over and over again, the Quran says God loves not the unbelievers. He loves not sinners. He loves not the hard neck. He only loves believers. And so for that reason, I couldn't be a Muslim. I think that the concept of God in Islam is morally inadequate. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Cut, cut it down. Cut that one down, sorry. Because uh, it's there. I'll shut it down this side. <laughs> Um, I don't know why I just restarted. I tried to hit stop and it didn't want to. Anyway, all right. <sighs> the Muslim concept of the love of God. We have to, we have to use equal standards. And when I have heard not only William Lane Craig, um, but others utilizing this argument, my mind has just kept going back more over and over again to so many examples where a sharp Muslim that knows the Bible, I mean, I, I think it's become pretty obvious that, that one of the, the primary um, things that I have to keep working on in, uh, in preparing myself as an apologist and doing work in this area is I have a, there, there's much more to know about the Quran and the Hadith. Um, more memorization, more familiarity with phraseology. Uh, I have to keep rereading the Quran. Um, you know, dealing with the Bible as a Christian, that's just a, that, that, that's the world that you, you live in. It's the, it's the, the atmosphere that you breathe. You're, you're constantly making reference to it and looking at it and things like that. That's not the case with the Quran. So I have to, every once in a while, just put it back into my rotation and go through it again and listen to it again and spend time uh, um, flying back from South Africa. And I, I may try to uh, do so on the way back uh, from, uh, from Berlin uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, I spent some great time uh, on the plane looking very closely at the Arabic of certain texts and and uh, looking up other uh, references and cross-references and grammatical stuff. And it's, it's an obvious advantage to know the Quran and the Hadith in speaking to Muslims, just as, obviously, the more a, a Muslim apologist, one engaging in Dawah, has meaningful knowledge of the Bible, the better they're going to be able to communicate to a Christian and the stronger their arguments are going to be. Uh, in fact, I, I would fault the majority of my Muslim opponents at that very point. Um, they are willing to take the most facile views of the Bible rather than uh, doing serious study. And so when I, when I approach this subject, I go, man, you know, if the first thought across my mind is not, is this guy I'm talking to, if it's in, in a situation where I'm involved, is this guy I'm talking to going to be sharp enough to hold me to a set of biblical examples that will keep me from being able to make this argument? You never think that way. Never, ever, ever think that way. Always respond to the best. And if the other guy doesn't give you the best, well, then you got to adjust to what he's said. But don't start off with, with arguments that you're going to have to be backpedaling from. Uh, I, learned, I learned that, you know, the Lord protected me more than once, standing outside the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City, 
um, I learned many, many times. You you start with the best, and that'll put you in good stead if that ends up being a long conversation, maybe one that develops into correspondence and everything else, um, where they're not constantly reminding you, yeah, well, remember the first thing you said to me, you had to backpedal from. I mean, your foundation is destroyed at that, at that point. Just a practical thing there. Going to this particular example, what do I mean? Well, there are numerous instances in the Bible where God demonstrates that his action of love is at least as complex as that of humans and more so. I am afraid that when Dr. Craig talks about omnibenevolence, what he means is panbenevolence. Now, omnibenevolence would mean that God is love, and therefore he acts in such a way that is always consistent with love as he defines it. But how does he define it? That's the question. How does any of us define it? For example... When you're defining and speaking of God's love, shouldn't the very first thing you think of, ontologically, biblically, systematic theology, in systematic theology, whatever phraseology you want to use, shouldn't the first thought in our mind be the love that God has eternally expressed? And what love is that? Intertrinitarian love. In fact, that's one of the arguments that the early church used. I know it's an argument that I actually have heard William Lane Craig use. I'm not sure if he sees what the connection here is. But the first and primary love of God is love of the Father for the Son, the Son for the Spirit, the Spirit for the Father, the, the, the love that exists internally within the triune Godhead. Because until there was creation... That was the only love there was, right? And so you go, what, what does that have to do with anything? Well, if you're going to talk about the love of God, if you're going to, if you're going to say that God is omnibenevolent, you have to define what you mean by that. And unfortunately, non-reformed folks tend to define omnibenevolence in such a way as to destroy the ability of God to love even on the level that mankind himself loves. I would argue that loving Pharaoh in exactly the same way as Moses is an incoherent statement given the biblical revelation of the book of Exodus. You want to argue that? I mean, if you if you identify omnibenevolence as an absolute equality of love in the expression of God, then God is not capable of loving in different ways in light of his own purposes and goals in creation. We have the ability to do that. We have been given the capacity and ability to love in different ways. We are called to love all men. Well, especially those of the brethren. Oh, especially what? There's there's supposed to be a there's supposed to be a special love that I can express for those who are of the Christian faith over against someone who is not? Yeah. Why? Well, because we have a foundation for that love. Mm, that's interesting. We share something in common. That's interesting. We've often used, and it is a perfectly appropriate example, we have often used the fact that we are to love our wives. But we're not to love everybody else's wives in the same way. There is a distinction that is to be made. We're to love our enemies. And yet, there is a proper time to engage, well, as Ecclesiastes says, there's a time for peace and a time for war. And if my enemy is seeking to bring about injustice and ungodliness, well, there's a time for war. So we have to be able to balance these things. 
And we as human beings are able to do that and are able to make distinctions in the kind and object of our love and to be able to prioritize our expressions of love so that, so that as I argued years ago when John Piper said that he would not defend uh, his home against uh, an invader, uh, my response was, I think that's totally unbiblical. I have a responsibility to defend my wife. And I do not have, and this is not about John Piper, but if you want to present the idea of a of a person trying to imitate an omnibenevolent God who is who cannot make differentiation in love, so that you see this person attacking your wife and you're now conflicted because you love this attacker just as much as you love your wife. And so you don't know what to do. I don't respect a person like that. Does anyone respect a person like that? How, how can anyone respect a person like that? I mean, even in that situation, you shouldn't call the cops because the cops might hurt this poor guy that I love so much. Right? So I, this, I, I'm sorry, but the reason that we are capable of recognizing the propriety of a love for my wife that means I must take action to protect her against this aggressor is because we possess the Imago Dei. We possess the image of God. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you that God must have this ability too because where does the Imago Dei come from? We cannot have capacities and abilities that are beyond more complex, more advanced than God himself. So, we must differentiate. We must differentiate. If we're going to make any sense out of redemption history, if you're going to make any sense out of those stiff-necked Israelites on the far bank of the Red Sea and the drowning Egyptians in the middle of the Red Sea, If you're going to make any sense out of that and the 100 other examples of clear differentiation on God's part as to how he dealt with people and the fact that you must hold together the statement, God is love, with the thrice statement of the angels, holy, holy, holy. God is holy. Well, holiness and love are going to be held together in perfect balance in God but identifying omnibenevolence as pan-benevolence is not going to hold that balance together, just as it cannot be held together in any human being in that way. And so, if I am going to criticize the Islamic view of God, I am going to be very much aware of the fact that you can go to numerous places in the Bible and say, well, then why did God do this? Or why did God do this in this way? And why did God do that in that way? And that's why I don't go there. I'm not saying there isn't something valid here. But you all know how I differentiate. Well, you all know. Um, regular listeners. Well, Algo always knows. Because Algo's Algo, and that's scary. But And um, Nick knows. There's no question that Nick knows. And there's, I've met a few other folks, and especially overseas, that, that know and they all frighten me uh, terribly, and I have bad dreams at night about them. But 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 regular people in the audience, uh, if you if you have listened to, especially the audience questions that I will have, some exact same situation as that. That looked like a university. It reminded me of uh, uh, City College Dublin. Uh, Trinity College in Dublin just a couple years ago where we had those really good audience question times. I remember really good audience question times because most of the time audience questions are not really good times anyways, but those really were. And if you've watched any of them, then you know, or if you've listened to my presentations on Islam, then you know where I go on this subject. And it's not to say, well, Allah is unloving because the Quran does say that he loves and that there is a certain type of people he loves and it does say he does not love certain individuals 
And you can find places in the Bible, whether you like it or not, where it talks about God's hatred of sin and sinners. And then you see him destroying sinners and bringing his judgment to bear uh, on groups like the Amorites. That's why a lot of these folks try to try to say that didn't really happen or it's just it's it's exalted language. And, you know, he just wiped out a few armies. But, you know, and I just sit back and go, um, blood, Noah, enough. You know, I mean, seriously, <laughs> you know, why, why, why do all this? Well, they didn't really wipe out all the Amorites. Well, OK, let's go back to the flood. Can you get around that one? Well, yeah, he just drowned a couple people. And he just, it, oh, you know, OK. Anyway, that, that's not where I go because there are counterexamples. But is there a difference between Christianity and Islam on the issue of God's love? Well, of course there is. You just don't get there by by asserting pan benevolence. Um, as William Lane Craig did, you have to be a, a little bit more specific and I think a little bit more theological in your presentation, specifically uh, to point out not the, the fundamental difference is that the Christian God has proven his love. How could a law prove his love? What would be given the transcendence? And the guy started off with the assertion of transcendence. He said, you know, your your Kalam argument, very similar to, and of course, obviously very similar to arguments that Muslims have used in uh, in times past in regards to the existence of God and the transcendence of God, so on and so forth. But given the, what I would call, hyper-transcendence of Allah, the, the, re, the repulsion that the theology of Islam shows for any kind of direct personal contact between Allah and his creation in the way that we view God and the way that even the Old Testament views God. What's the key issue? And there's, there's an advantage going my direction here, by the way, because it, it presents a direct entrance into gospel presentation. How has God proven his love in Christianity? The incarnation. The incarnation and the cross. Um, now, if you don't want to go for the cross for historical reasons, that particular point in time, you can you know, just go for incarnation, then move on to that. But the point is, this really is the issue of the incarnation. And it was right there. I mean, he had just answered that. And then seemingly just, you know, the two natures of Christ and then psh, the natural thing would have been you're right there asserting, asserting the two natures of Christ. Now you can say, and you know what my criticism of the nature of God in Islam would be? Is that that divine human person, that, that one person with two natures, is the demonstration of God's true love for his creation in that he entered into his own creation. And that is a demonstration that's utterly impossible in light of the Islamic view of Allah and his transcendence and the fact that he could never and would never enter into his own creation. So that seemed to me to be the obvious way to tie the two together straight to a gospel presentation and straight to uh, the point you want to make, and that is that there is a problem with the Islamic understanding of God's love. Without that mediator, this is the, the fundamental issue that I close most of my presentations on Islam with, is you... Those of you who've seen my presentation, and the guy across the window is just starting to beat the drum louder and louder that we need to put this thing on DVD and Blu-ray so we can send it out to churches, have them watch that, and then hook up electronically to answer questions with Skype and things like that. Uh, he's, he's pounding the drum out there. But those of you who've already seen that presentation know that um and I, I i can't well I, I might be able to bring it up here but i i i'll, I'll just describe it to you and and oh you know, i can click while while doing other things i i i conclude my my presentation normally it goes you know i i talk about the nature of god and salvation um and uh no, I do not want to update now. I, I hate when things do that. Um, 
sometimes if I have more time, I will also, it, it's hard to avoid at least doing a section on uh, the, the, the Quran because people just don't, don't have the background to it and things like that. Um, but if I've got a short period of time, I do the nature of God and salvation. And I enjoy trying to narrate um, some uh, some hadith specifically that you know the man who killed ninety nine people and 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 the issues like that. But when I get to the end, all right, I'm gonna send you. Uh, I'm gonna I've got to go to this first because it then it then I go back to window and then I go to keynote. And you should be getting Keynote now, yes? All right. All right. Uh, problem is, I think if I click on this, it'll work. At least I hope so. So after I tell the story, I start making application specifically to the fact that in Islam, you have a holy God. You have his law. You have vivid descriptions of hellfire. So you have sin. You have heaven. What don't you have? Because of the ignorance of Muhammad, what do you not have? You don't have a mediator. You don't have a mediator. Jesus has been removed. He's merely a prophet. You do not have that mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. And the result is, you got it? All right, let's see if it starts. Yeah, there it is. Bring her up. June 30th, 2007, Glasgow Airport, Scotland. I show this. This was the incident at the Glasgow Airport. Two men, you can see people running from the, uh, from the check-in counters, check-in counters that I have checked in at more than once. They have driven a Jeep chair into the doorway, pressed a button, and it exploded. Thankfully, they weren't very good at making fuel bombs. The bomb was intended to spew all of that gas into the, uh, into the airport and, and kill those people. The only people that died were the two people in the car, and they only over a period of, I think, three weeks from their burns, which is a really, really bad way to go. Really, really bad way to go. Uh, in fact, I think that guy in the shirt there is one of the guys, actually. Um, they were Muslims. And they, yeah, I, I think I think that's one of them right there. They did this purposely, obviously. I can't imagine. That's where it freezes, so you can bring it down into a window. I, I can't imagine um, the mindset of no seeing all these people around and yet gunning that engine, undoubtedly screaming Allahu Akbar, and then hitting that trigger and igniting that fuel bomb. Why'd they do it? Because theology matters. Because the only, the only guarantee that the Quran can provide to you of true peace with Allah when you die is if you die in a state of jihad. You die in an act of jihad. And these men were not down and outers. They weren't people that just didn't have anything else to do. They were both national health system physicians. Doctors. Two doctors. There you go. Theology matters. That's what happens when you have a holy God, law, hell, punishment, heaven, no mediator. No mediator.